So my name is Jennifer Collins. Welcome to the Newtown Lions Club food insecurity panel discussion. Purpose of this presentation is to build awareness about the food security issues and tell you about our second semi-annual Stuff a Truck event, which is currently scheduled for Saturday, April 6th at the Stop and Shop in Newtown. Today we have Gary Peters here, our first presenter, who's acquainted with the food security um, issues, both globally and locally. And the facts to be presented, they weave together global, national, and local story that really can't be ignored. We also have Arnie Berman here. He will describe the Newtown Lions efforts to try to relieve the effects of food insecurity locally by our semi-annual Stuff a Truck event. Sometimes the terms food insecurity and hunger are confused. Hunger refers to an individual, whereas food insecurity really refers to the family unit. As far as the magnitude of the problem, about 2.23 billion people worldwide and more than 40 million people domestically have experienced <clears throat> excuse me, some level of food insecurity. Gary, how did you become aware of the food insecurity issue? Well, about eight years ago, I began driving a food truck mobile kitchen uh, into the uh, projects in Bridgeport uh, Marina Village. And uh, I was amazed when I would uh, arrive on a Monday evening and find anywhere from 90 to 140 people lined up for an evening meal. Uh, generally, about 40% of the people that were in line were children. And um, as I learned during the summer that uh, many of those children, that meal that night was gonna be their first meal of the day. And over driving the food truck down there and getting to know the people down there, it really put a whole different face on food insecurity, one that was very different than what I expected. Uh, and over and above that, uh, I've been involved here in Newtown with the Interfaith uh, Partnership for Refugee Resettlement and working with the refugees that our group has, uh, uh, has, has helped immigrate into this country. Uh, that gave me a much better understanding of what was going on worldwide. I see. So maybe um, explain to us what exactly is food insecurity? Yeah, and, and, and I normally don't like to read things for something like this, but here I, I want to make sure that I get all of the wording correctly. Food insecurity refers to the economic and social condition that limits access to safe, nutritious food and sufficient amounts of it. According to the United States Department of Agriculture, people who face food insecurity do, gener do not generally have sufficient resources to access food on a regular basis, to sustain a healthy lifestyle, so that they may eat lower quality food or skip meals in their entirety. And is this really a global, a national, or a regional problem? Well, it's all three. And, and from a global standpoint, as you just pointed out, uh, there are roughly 2.3 billion people worldwide that do not have adequate food supplies. And when the issue of food insecurity grows worse by the day, and it is exacerbated by uh, wars such as Ukraine and Gaza. And if we just look at a couple of countries to give you uh, uh, an idea of the magnitude, Republic of Congo in, in uh, Africa, 26% of the population is food insecure. Afghanistan. 46 percent, Yemen, 55 percent, Syria, 55 percent, Pakistan, 43 percent. Those five countries alone represent 85 million people that are food insecure with millions of people going hungry. And um, as I said, it gets worse and worse by the day. And globally, there are between 250,000 and 400,000 children currently suffering from wasting disease. They are starving to death. And the issues related to the mass migration, unrest, wars have been fought over food insecurity. And really, all we have to do is think about the, uh, the potato famine in Ireland, where two million people left Ireland because they had a choice of leaving Ireland or starving. 
And really globally, what are some of the causes of food insecurity? You know, the, the kind of the Cliff Notes uh, version of that, because um, we can talk about that for weeks and weeks on end. They're all the things that, that we see happening globally. Wars, armed conflicts, hostilities, soaring uh, fertilizer prices, unsustainable uh, farming, economic shocks, poverty, food price inflation, lack of potable water, uh, things we don't necessarily think about, but there, there are any number of countries that have more food than, than they necessarily need. But for a variety of political reasons, countries like India that restrict their rice exports. Uh, and the other big thing that we all hear about today, climate change. Climate change is dramatically impacting food insecurity. Droughts, floods, uh, pest infestations, wildfires. So all of those things add to the global issues of food insecurity. And a little closer to home in America, where are some of our neighbors with respect to this issue? Well, we, everyone, everyone today is very, very sensitive to the issues of um, people migrating to our country, coming across our southern borders. And that is a, that is a very, very difficult and challenging issues. When you have upwards of um, when you have upwards of 26 million people in uh, Latin, America, Latin America and the Caribbean that are suffering food insecurity and starving, they're not coming to this country because they want to. They're coming to this country because they don't want to starve to death. And you look at the numbers, uh, Guatemala, 26.6% of their population, food insecure. Colombia, 62% of their population, 3 million people. Honduras, 28%. Uh, Haiti, 48% before the, the hostilities that began a couple of weeks ago. And Dominican Republic, 15%. How many of us have vacationed in the Dominican Republic and thought about the fact that in that very small country, 1.5 million people are food insecure and going to bed hungry every night? And when we look at that 25, 26 million people in those, those six countries that suffer food insecurity, 8 million of those people are children. Mm. And how does the United States compare? Well, we compare reasonably well compared to, uh, obviously, a number of the countries. But and we have to look at the levels of food insecurity. And the numbers we were talking about previously are all severe food in, uh, insecurity. In this country, 12.8% of the population, 17 million people. Uh, are, insecure, are insecure, but looking at the statistics from Feeding America, there are upwards of 48 million people in this country that are suffering some level of food insecurity. And uh, how do we do uh, versus uh, some of our allies? United Kingdom is 8.8%. Uh, Germany is 4.3%. So. We're better than a lot of parts of the world, but we're not doing what we need to do. And what are some of the causes of food insecurity here in Connecticut? Here in Connecticut, uh, food insecurity here in Connecticut is, 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 is a challenge. The answer to that really is what we all know and love about the state. The, recently, the U.S. Department of Agriculture came out with a uh, statistic indicating that for a family of four to maintain a basic lifestyle, not, uh, not an outrageous lifestyle, a very basic lifestyle, that family of four needs an income of $126,000 a year. And the majority of the people that are suffering food insecurity are working multiple minimum wage jobs. Um, what are the causes? What we all know, inflation, rise in food costs, cost of housing, 
You, our utility costs are the second highest in the country. Our health care costs, uh, lack of public transportation. Uh, people have to spend a lot of money to drive cars to get to work to their jobs. Consumes a, lot, a large part of their income. You take many parts of Europe, people can, can travel to their jobs at low or very, very low price cost on public transportation. And there are any number of families who make just enough money to not be available to participate in the SNAP program. And the SNAP program is the Supplemental Nutritional Assistance Program. It's a great program, but people reach a threshold where they can't participate in the program, but with the cost of housing, with the cost of all of those other costs that we see in this state, there's just not enough money left to buy food. And bringing it even more local to here in Newtown, um, how do Fairfield, Litchfield, and New Haven counties look, and how do they compare to Newtown? Yeah, well, county-wise, uh, Fairfield, Litchfield, and New Haven, they're all about average. We're all at about 10 percent of the population is food insecure. Now, what does 10 percent mean in uh, Fairfield County? That's 100,000 people. You know, we're regularly touted as being one of the wealthiest counties in the country, yet 100,000 people are deemed as severely food insecure. Uh, as far as locally, Newtown is, is, is fortunate. It's a, it's a, a prosperous community, 6.3 percent of our population, but that is 1,700 people. Uh, Bethel, 7 percent, 1,300 people. Danbury, 10 percent. Uh, and now as we go down and we look at Bridgeport, 16.2 percent, 24,000 people. Waterbury, 16.5 percent. 18,750. So, and these people are really all our geographic neighbors. And what are the implications of food insecurity? Well, we have implications. We have to look at the implications with children because they are, they are, they are just so impacted. And, and, and doing some of the volunteer work I do in Bridgeport, I see it all the time. Uh, their phys physical development, their intellectual development, their learning disabilities, uh, mental health issues, their increased sus susceptibility to childhood diseases. Uh, frequently the children are being brought up without access to fresh fruit, fresh vegetables, proper types of food to eat. So there's uh, obesity, uh, childhood diabetes. Um, and uh, increased hospitalizations and increases in health care. And, and these are all kinds of things that we don't necessarily think how things like their health care costs impact all of our lives. The adults uh, are, have all of the same kinds of things, plus they have more skeletal muscular problems. Uh, they have a variety of other physical issues that are manifested by the food insecurity because typically they'll be food insecure for many, many years. And uh, the, uh, the other big part of it is what it does to the family, what the societal impact of the food insecurity. And uh, we see it with families that are coming in, families at risk that are coming into places like Bridgeport Rescue Mission. Uh, they they don't have enough money to both pay the rent and buy the food. And they end up uh, as at-risk mothers, and we see a lot of mothers and children that are absolutely at risk. So it's a societal issue. And um, with the individuals and families that you've met utilizing the food banks, can you share with us some of your personal observations? My, my observations are interesting because they put a whole different face. We, I think many of us have a tendency to, to have our own thoughts and mental images of, of people that are seeking charitable organizations. I have met 
so many people, so many great people, so many wonderful people. These folks are so appreciative of what others are doing for them, so thankful about what other people are doing for them. They don't take it for granted. And I can tell you from firsthand experience that many of these people are very, very unhappy that they have to seek a food bank uh, to, to, to be able to support themselves. They don't want to do that. They're proud. And, and this takes away their pride, and it hurts the children. I, I, I see the, I see the um, uh, mothers when they bring their children into the food pantry. Uh, they don't want their children to be in that food pantry. They want their children to understand what it is to be independent. And candidly, from a personal standpoint, because I've, I've met so many people over the years, and, and from time to time, I will not be present down there for a few days or for a week or two for whatever reason. And when I return, I have all these people coming up to me, where have you been? Are you okay? Do you have a problem? reaching out to see if I need help from them because they want to give back. And, and, and I have some, I, what's interesting is, is there are some folks that I've, I've really gotten to know over the years. Women that are well past their 70th birthday using walkers uh, that are walking a mile and a half in each direction, even when it's raining and snowing, to get to the food bank, because that's what they have to do. So uh, it's 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 uh, it's been very fulfilling, actually, from a personal standpoint. And it's it's I suggest anyone that would like to volunteer in any food bank, and do it regularly, because you're going to meet some great people. Um, are there any other resources available? Well, and, and, and what happens with the, uh, the food banks, because these are, these are massive operations at times, and we have a national organization, Feeding America. Feeding America works with over 600 providers and affiliated food banks, and they work to try and organize uh, food drives. They work uh, very much on the corporate level to get corporate funding for food banks, food pantries, soup kitchens, um, because again, they, they, the, the st stats from Food America is that their organization serves 44 million people, including 13 million children. Locally, we have Connecticut Food Share. Connecticut Food Share works with 600 local providers and programs. And again, they help organize food drives. They help organize stuff-a-truck events, not ours, but other stuff-a-truck events. And they also uh, they do a lot of supplemental food problem programs for seniors because housebound seniors have huge problems because they can't get out and they don't have the money and they're not Frequently, they're not uh, avail uh, able to avail themselves of home health care of any variety. Uh, so they have programs for seniors, and they also help people uh, apply to SNAP because, again, a lot of uh, a lot of people um, don't know how to do the paperwork. We don't necessarily in this country make the paperwork easy. Now, on a local basis. Uh, we have uh, Daily Bread Food Pantry in, in Danbury, and they do a great job. They're open two mornings a week, two afternoons a week. Uh, people have to show their ID and, and register, uh, but they're open to people from any geographic area. They don't ask who you are. They don't ask where you're from. Uh, they annually support a little over 31,000 families. And uh, their volunteers prepackage food bags uh, that the people come in, grab a food bag, but they, they can also shop for personal care products and uh, household cleaning products. Uh, Faith Food Pantry here in, in, uh, in, in Newtown, 
uh, open two hours uh, a day, two days a week, and one Saturday a month. And uh, people showed their ID and uh, um, what have you. Faith, faith is open to Newtown and San Diego, Sandy Hook uh, residents only. They support uh, about 1,400 families and about 3,900 clients. In 2023, they, uh, they provided uh, around 80,000 meals uh, to their families and clients. Uh, they provide prepackaged uh, food bags. Hospitality Hall at Newtown Congregational Church is a little different. It's an anomaly. It's open four days a week, seven hours a day most of the year. In the summer, uh, only two days a week. Uh, they are open to all in need. They don't ask for any registration. There are no ID requirements. Uh, and they operate almost on uh, an honor system with great results. And what they, what they have found interesting is that because it is a little different operating on the honor system, they find that people are very respectful of that, and they know that they can take one or two or three items, and that's all they do. The other thing is that they support primarily, most of their uh, recipients are Newtown residents. Many of their residents and many of the people that use Hospitality Hall are neighbors of all of us. And they don't want to have to sign in somewhere because they don't want their neighbors to know that they have to use a food bank. Uh, Bridgeport Rescue Mission, uh, where I do uh, quite a bit of stuff, they're open three days a week, four hours a day. Uh, plus, they do some massive uh, events, Thanksgiving. Uh, thank this past Thanksgiving, they distributed over 10,000 turkeys and Thanksgiving dinners. Um, but uh, people show an ID and register, but it's open to all people, no geographic restrictions. Annually, they support uh, about 17,000 families, um, 63,000 individuals. 70% of the children have families, and 18%, 18 and 19% of the uh, families have senior citizens. Uh, people shop with volunteer uh, guides. The community cafe is open on the three days that the uh, food pantry is open, and uh, they will serve over 900,000 hot meals this year, uh, and that amounts to over a million pounds of food. And uh, Walnut Hill Community uh, Food Bank uh, in Bethel, they're open uh, twice a month. Families registered. The pantry is open to all with no geographic uh, limits. And they distribute between 1,600 and 1,800, uh, or they support between 16 and 1,800 uh, families a month. Wow. Those are some amazing stats, and those five food pantries sound really welcoming to the community, which I'm sure we're all appreciative of. Where exactly does the food come from? People like you and me. That's the, the short answer. The, the food banks all survive with $5, $25 donations. They get big donations, but it's the, it's the small donations, donations of food, donations of personal supplies, house cleaning supplies, et cetera. Uh, then, and the financial contra contributions they get from corporations, et cetera, help them purchase the food that they need that gets supplemented. Uh, they get generous food donations from Big Y, Stop and Shop, Bazudos, uh, ShopRite, Stu Leonard's, and, and local farmers in season. And again, the corporate donors. The problem is, the real problem that everybody is struggling with is that the needs have grown dramatically and continue to grow every year. The levels of corporate support have softened and the levels of corporate support are not what they were a few years ago. So the food pantries are hard pressed. Uh, you know, when we serve when we serve lunches uh, down at the pantry, down at uh, uh, the mission, uh, 
when when I'm bringing the food out to the uh, serving line, I can tell what the uh, donation level has been that week. Sometimes we provide beautiful scrumptious meals to everybody that's there. Other times, it's hot dogs because that's all that came in. And to assist then, what is it that the public at large can do and what are the new town lions doing? Well, it would be nice if we could solve all the problems of society, but we can't. But we need to work together. It's critical that we work together and it's critical that we recognize that's what's, what's happening in Afghanistan, what's happening in Haiti, what's happening in Bridgeport, at some point that impacts every one of this uh, and we can't avoid that. Uh, I like to paraphrase Patrick Geddes and his uh, think globally, act locally. He talks about health care but it works for food insecurity. In health thinking globally encourages a worldwide vision of what is done, not done, should be done, to alleviate equitably the burden of disease and causes of ill health. Acting locally is a call on people to become active participants, no longer the passive subject of what is being done for and by them. I'm proud to say that the Newtown Lions Club members are active participants, not passive subjects. Acting locally. Thank you, Jennifer. No, thank you for all of the insights and the information explaining about the food insecurity issue and, and what can be done and what is, is occurring to be done. Um, and in that same vein, I'd like to introduce uh, Arnie Berman uh, to speak about the second semi-annual Stuff a Truck event that, again, is scheduled for April 6th on Saturday at Stop and Shop in Newtown. So thank you for joining us, Arnie. We're thrilled to have you. Um, Arnie is a Sandy Hook resident who appeared over 100 times on CNN. BC to offer his take. But this is my first time on Community Access. Uh, yes, so I'm, I'm pretty excited about that. that. That's great. That is so wonderful. Um, and we thank you for joining us. Um, and I, we understand you're a devoted member of the Newtown Lions Club and that you're here to talk to us about the Stuff a Truck uh, food drive. And what would you like to tell us about that? Well, first of all, I'd like to tell you that I have a very tough act to follow. My, <laughs> my fellow Lion, Gary, just gave a very, very compelling presentation and is so much more knowledgeable in this subject than I can hope to be. But I, I can talk about what the Lions are doing specifically in Newtown to help. Well, and, that's great, and I think one of our big questions um, would be, why now? Well, there's obviously a lot going on in the world, Jennifer. There's a <laughs> lot of distractions. People could focus on this presidential election. They could focus on the, you know, whether or not the Princess of Wales is okay. But instead, we can also focus on things that are, that are very here and now. And the reason that we're having this event now is because people are hungry. As Gary just recounted, that there are food insecurity issues that live with us right here in, you know, in Fairfield County, where one in ten, ten people are food insecure. That includes um, a great number of children. I think it's about 380,000 children in Connecticut are food insecure. There is always a political element in this. I was fascinated by the fact that in your presentation, you pointed out Haiti has a, a 48 percent rate of food insecurity versus the Dominican Republic at 15 percent. Well, they share the same island. They share the same island. But the politics are different. Yeah. Politics can affect things. And, and here in the United States, where the politics, believe it or not, are considerably better than they are in Haiti. But, you know, the, just not to interrupt, but you know I always interrupt you anyway. Yeah, you do. <laughs> <laughs> when, when you say that. Food insecurity in the Congo is at 26% of the population. State of Mississippi, food insecurity is 26%. No, that's pretty fascinating. There's not that many differences abroad and here local. Well, and here locally, one of the things you can say is that while there's not a lot to be fond of in remembering the pandemic period, some of the programs that came along 
really did a great deal to reduce poverty rates and to reduce the number of children that were food insecure and hungry. And since those programs hit an expiration date about 18 months ago, we have seen a spike in the number of people that, that are hungry and food insecure. And that's one more thing that's making any contribution, any effort that the Lions can get involved in to help. It makes it, it makes it quite timely. And what exactly makes this Stuff a Truck event different from other different types of food drives for charity? Well, we've done a couple of things. First of all, we've designed our Stuff a Truck event to be just a whole heck of a lot of fun. <laughs> and, and that begins with the truck. Here, show, show this for a second, would you, Pete? I'm holding up a picture of the truck, right? It is a wicked cool Oshkosh military tactical vehicle that is great for, fill, for when you fill it with groceries. It's a lot of fun to look at. Kids see it from the road. They want to come see it. Their parents, they want to see it. Um, so it's not like we went to U-Haul and you know just got a regular old plain vanilla dry van. We've got this wicked cool vehicle that people really want to check out. If I recall, it was interesting to um, just all different ages. I think our older population was interested. It brought back some memories to those who served. And the kids thought the truck was amazing and they wanted to climb inside. And I know they were very generous with allowing the children to do that. And uh, there was a lot of curiosity around the truck, which was great to bring people in to see what the event was and about. You're, and you're make referring donations. to the event that we did on September 30. Yes at another market in Newtown. Mm -hmm. And like then, the vehicle's being provided by the, the 411th uh, Civil Affairs Battalion mm -hmm. of the U.S. Army Reserves. Mm -hmm. They drive the truck. They're with us all day. They're incredibly helpful and devoted. They're, they're based in Danbury, and we're, we're thrilled that they're, uh, that they're able to participate again. Another thing we do to make it fun, besides the, the truck, is we, we have designed it to maximize contributions and to minimize barriers to entry. So the typical food drive, you hand people a piece of paper, you ask them to wander up and down the aisles and find items that the pantries need. Well, folks can do that if they want, but we offer a different option that's a little easier. We offer pre-bagged options. We offer a $10 bag, that's enough to feed a family of four for lunch. We offer a $20 bag that's enough to feed a family of four for dinner. So people know exactly the value that they are providing. And it makes it so easy that pe people really gravitate towards that, that option. Um, so those, the those combination of those things created a very successful event for us in September, and we think we're going to have an even bigger one uh, come April 6th. So tell us a little bit about um, the September 2023 event. That was the first ever Stuff a Truck for the Newtown Lions. And mm -hmm. tell us, um, what do you think made that event so successful, and what's a, some, you know, a personal memory that you recall from that event that made it special? Well, it was working with the two of you that, <laughs> <is> part of <laughs> it, but that made it very special. Um, Part of what made that event, that the big why, so special was like the management at Stomp and Shop. Uh, managements of both markets have been very devoted to making sure that we have a very successful event, bringing on extra staff, devoting uh, man and woman power and space, um, helping us bag the groceries, doing everything they can to, to advertise and support the event that we're having. Um, at the event we had in September, we stuffed the truck with over 300 bags of pre-bagged groceries worth well over $3,000. We also had several hundred dollars in other contributions from people wandering up and down the aisles. We also collected about $1,300 in cash contributions. The thing that blew me away most is that as you look at all of the shoppers that came into Big Y that day, we had a shopper participation rate of 50%. That's amazing. It's, it was really cool. People were excited and wanted to be a part of it. It was a, it was a great day to shop. It was a great day to be a lion. Um, 
And despite and we, the fact that the weather was a little inclement and on right. and, and off, perfect. I still feel like the vibe overall of people leaving the market was just amazing as far as they're just feeling good about themselves, that they were able to contribute something on a, a busy weekend there, day. There, there was no hesitation, and, and frankly, mm -hmm. I was amazed by the number of people that just reached for that $20 bag mm -hmm. and said, that's what we're going to do. We, we, we had it sold as many of those $20 bags as we did $10 bags. And to, and to give you an idea, quietly, that amounted to because at the mission we weighed everything and then extrapolated. That amounted to about 2,400 pounds of wow. food. That's amazing. And this time, why Stop and Shop for April? Well, so first of all, Stop and Shop wanted to be involved, right? And they also wanted to be part of something that was a, that was a big deal. And one of the reasons we're excited about Stop and Shop is that Stop and Shop is the biggest supermarket in, in Newtown. That, and on a given Saturday, they had tracked as many shoppers as all the other markets in Newtown combined. Mm. So if we have anything like the participation rate that we did last time, we're going to have an even more successful event that feeds more mouths than mm. we did before. Wonderful. And, and is hunger overall a big focus of the Newtown Lions? It is. It's one of the major focus areas of, of Newtown Lions International. I'm sorry, of Lions Clubs International, uh, which oversees 48,000 clubs in a couple hundred countries, and it's a major focus of our club too. And it became a bigger focus at the end of last year when we did our first stuff a truck event. We're going to do two, two of these a year, and we're looking at all kinds of other initiatives to help address hunger issues as well. But beyond that, there's a lot of causes to our organization that matter. We're, we're focused on, on vision, preventable blindness, diabetes, environment, childhood cancer, and hunger. Those are, those are all the major focal points. We're just a, we're a group of dedicated men and women that from all walks of life that want to work together to serve their communities. It's the motto of the club. We serve, and that, that's what we do. And uh, with this particular event coming up again on Saturday, April 6th, um, at the Stop and Shop in Newtown, which food banks ultimately will the food be provided to? I know we heard a little bit about that from and, Gary. And it was actually several of the ones that, that Gary mentioned in his mm -hmm. presentation. So it'll be in, in Newtown, we'll be given to Hospitality Hall, we'll be given to the Faith Food Pantry. Mm -hmm. uh, Daily Bread in Danbury, mm -hmm. and also the, uh, the Bridgeport Rescue Mission. All right. And um, just circling back to something that you said a, a moment ago, um, how is it that you think this event um, attracted that 50 percent participation rate? What was it, do you feel, that on that particular day, again, even given the weather, um, that just drove people to want to contribute to that level of 50 percent participation? Look, I, I could credit Big Y. I could credit the Lions. I could credit the Army Reserves and the mm -hmm. Wicked Cool Truck. <laughs> But really, I think it's the people in Newtown that made it a successful event. Yeah. This town is full of incredibly generous people. And I think the sense of community here is profound. I think it became more profound as a result of the tragedy of 2012. People then wish they could help, but when given a chance to help out their neighbors, well, that's exactly what we do. And so I think in this town, it's a great chance for us to all come together, and I hope we do on April 6th once more. Well, that's great, and I was glad that it was such a success when we um, had our first event last year, and looking forward to the event on April 6th at Stop and Shop Newtown, and we really hope that the public comes out um, even greater force to contribute and help the community. So thank you both for participating in our panel discussion and, and explaining all the issues on food insecurity globally and here, um, local in Connecticut and in Newtown. So thank you very much. It's been great it's been to be your guest. It's been great to be your guest, as a matter of fact.